This is the ninth session in the Byzantine Empire, but I've titled this particular session The Breakdown. The great arc of imperial history begins in 395 with the division of the empire between eastern and western parts, and for the next 150 years or so, the eastern empire flatlines at a very high level, or it slightly improves in terms of population and prosperity. The Eastern Empire sits out the barbarian invasions and the collapse of the Western Empire, and it is unscathed, or it finds that it is living in a much more enjoyable situation than it had in the 150 years before the division of the empire into those two halves. The empire then, for a combination of natural and human causes, goes into decline around, shall we say, around 540. It's probably not a good idea to date this to a particular year and certainly not to a particular month within a particular year. Indeed, you might even say, let's date the empire's downward slide to around 550, which is a little after we know that it started, but let's do that. It then goes down and down and down, and the bottom point... When would that be? Maybe 717, the second siege of Constantinople, when the Arabs are driven off with the use of Greek fire? Is it maybe 750, when we believe that the global temperature began to increase? Whatever the case, sometime during the 8th century, the empire begins to recover. Looking at the reign of Irene, you can see that the empire is recovering. And certainly once you get to the end of the 9th century, once you come up towards 900 AD, you can see that the empire is recovering, or indeed has recovered, but is continuing to improve in terms of its own territorial security, in terms of its estimated population, and its estimated prosperity, and this upward course continues through that century until it reaches a peak around 1025. 1025 is the year in which Basil II died. He was the empire's greatest military emperor. He is perhaps the greatest of all their emperors, since the bottoming out of the long imperial decline. Let's have a look at a map of the empire. You can see that although the empire is nothing impressive compared with the empire ruled by Augustus, or the empire ruled by Constantine, or even the empire ruled by Justinian and his immediate successors, it is, in medieval terms, a large and an impressive swathe of territory. It contains what I think is the whole of modern Turkey and all of the Balkans south of the Danube, plus a large chunk of southern Italy and, of course, most of the islands in the eastern Mediterranean. This is the empire as it was left by Basil II. It is entirely secure. All of its borders are defensible in terms of natural barriers, and I'm looking here mostly at the Danube, or it is surrounded by satellite or various kinds of client state or by allies, or it's surrounded by states which are too small and too divided to present any danger to the empire. We don't have figures, and I must always make that admission when I make a bland statement of prosperity and demographic improvement, 
But if we don't have figures, you still can make these statements with some authority. So far as we can tell, the empire's economy has recovered from the low point of the early Middle Ages. The cities are being rebuilt, or the cities have been rebuilt. Constantinople is possibly below the size that it reached in the time of Justinian, but it is still the largest and richest city in Europe. It has now been joined by other large and wealthy cities, Thessalonica, Thebes, Corinth, Ephesus. Oh, the cities are not as large and they're not as numerous and they're not as important as they had been in the great days of antiquity, but the cities have now substantially recovered. So population has recovered, the economy has recovered, the empire's borders have been secured. Everything looks as it ought to be. You can stand on the sea walls of Constantinople looking inward over the city. You have a large and glittering ceremonial centre filled with the monuments inherited from what seems to be an incredibly distant and misty past. And you have the more recent monuments of the empire's recovery and prosperity. The Golden Horn is crowded with shipping. The Imperial Palace is filled with embassies from all the states and all the tribes that surround the empire, all seeking the empire's friendship or hoping that the empire will do it a favour in return for some past or prospective favour. This is the empire as it was left on the death of Basil II. And bearing in mind that the empire is now very old, there is every reason to suppose that the empire will last forever, that this is the end of history, the long upward struggle from the bad days of the 7th and 8th centuries. That's now a distant memory. That is now ancient history. The empire is now great and wealthy and respected and apparently secure, and it remain great and respected and wealthy and secure forever and ever. God has smiled, and the empire is under God's particular favour. Problem is that as we've now discovered, history doesn't end. History may have full stops, history may have chapter breaks, but it doesn't end. And it hasn't ended for the Empire, and it won't end, or rather it will end for the Empire eventually, but not for a while. What are the difficulties that are building up? I think the first difficulty is that Basil II dies in 1025 without leaving a son. He leaves daughters. There's nothing necessarily wrong with an empress. We know that Irene was a highly capable empress who did much to set the empire back on its upward course. But at the same time, daughters, if they are not particularly effective are not necessarily such a good thing for an empire. It is not that Basil II doesn't leave a son. It is that Basil II leaves progeny who are incapable of ruling the empire as he and his predecessors had. Something I haven't mentioned because it doesn't come up and I'm not really the best person for talking about this, but something I haven't mentioned is the Empire's great cultural recovery. I said something about this last week, but this cultural revival is now in full swing and it is a glorious thing if you look at the works of art that have survived from this period they are deeply impressive. They are beautiful. 
And that is not merely the visual arts. There is also a renaissance of literature, of philosophy, and, with its own terms, of the sciences. However, this kind of cultural renaissance is usually inseparable from the existence, or indeed the rise, of a landed nobility. Since the 19th century, and particularly in America before the 1970s, shall we say, it is possible that a wealthy commercial class will also be an effective patron of the arts, but the surest patron of the arts is a landed nobility. Basil II and his predecessors had been hostile as a matter of policy towards the very existence of a landed nobility. The emperors couldn't stop the regrowth of families which passed on their wealth to generation after generation, but they could certainly enforce all of the laws made by the successors of Heraclius to prevent these people from engrossing the lands of the peasantry, of the landed peasantry. Remember that the military backbone of the empire was the military tenures. The peasants had been given land in perpetuity, in alienable grants, on condition of military service. This was a wonderfully successful means of stopping the final extinction of the empire at the hands of Islam, and it also proved to be a fine device for the emperors when they went on the attack and reconquered all the way up to the Danube and all the way down to Antioch and beyond. But there is a conflict between the landed nobility and the landed peasantry, And then, within Constantinople, you have the growth of a bureaucracy. This had been downsized radically during the ages of decline and survival, but with the recovery, a new bureaucracy had been created, and this is now growing. What do these two big interest groups want? The nobility wants as much land as it can get. The bureaucracy wants as much of the state budget spent on the bureaucracy as possible. Neither of these interest groups is interested in those military tenures. Neither of those groups is interested in wars of continued conquest. They are interested in getting rid of as many of the armed forces as they possibly can. The navy is disbanded. The ships are allowed to rot at their docks. The military tenures, those can't be formally ended, but within a decade of Basil II's death, the peasants were turning up at their mustering point, saying, we're ready, we've got our uniforms, we've got our armour, we've got our horses. Who this year? And they were met by officials with rather nice fingernails who told them, no, no, there's, we're not going to war this year. We, we don't need any military service. But listen, I've got a, a, an interesting proposal to make to you. Why don't you give us some money, and in return for that, we won't ask you to turn out in armour, we won't take you away from your, no doubt, very useful duties on the land, you carry on growing food, pay us some money, and we won't require any further military service of you. And even if those peasants had thought, hmm, that doesn't sound such a good policy in the long term, that was the policy. The peasants are no longer militarily useful. They no longer have a firm protector at the centre in Constantinople. The nobles move in, buying up pieces of land, doing the usual noble engrossment things that one reads about in history books. The official classes in Constantinople make sure that no money is spent on the navy, no money is spent on the army, If you do need soldiers, it's much better to hire them for a campaign. That is, instead of having a national militia 
which can prove a little difficult. Indeed, Irene had found the army a little difficult when she wanted to shut down the iconoclast dispute. She found that the army was not at all happy with it, so she had to declare a fake war on the Arabs and send the army off while she summoned another council at Nicaea. But certainly the groups which now have control in Constantinople do not want a landed standing army. They rely instead on mercenary bands which are hired for a season or a particular campaign or a specific purpose. They're paid to do the job. When they've done the job, they're paid off and sent away. A much cleaner, a much more economically efficient arrangement. And so it carries on from 1025 through the 1030s, 40s, 50s and 60s until we get into the 1070s, pushing towards 50 years after the death of Basil II. The empire is rich, the empire is intact, everything looks fine. It's just that, as I said, history has not come to an end and there are new forces gathering outside the empire's borders which are not entirely favourable to the empire's existence. The Normans. The Normans have moved into southern Italy at the beginning of the 11th century. 999 they first arrive in Italy. They come, first of all, as returning pilgrims from the Holy Land, and they very quickly realise that Italy is a very fine place. Being Normans, they're not content simply to live there and enjoy the wine and the olive oil. They begin to conquer it. Here on the left on this slide is a map of Italy around the year 1000. You can see that the empire has those two big purple areas, plus a few other parts of southern Italy. On the right you have the Kingdom of Sicily in 1154, and you may ask yourself, so where have the imperial territories gone? To which the answer is, they have ceased to exist. The empire was kicked out of its last possessions in Italy, around 1070. It was a slow and not particularly embarrassing loss for the empire because Italy was always a bit on the marginal side and if the Normans want to take over southern Italy and if they want to retake Sicily from the Arabs, all well and good doesn't matter except that from about 1050 onwards the Normans find that it's rather convenient to sail across the Adriatic and start extending their conquests into those parts of the Balkan which have been imperial territory for a very long time now. So the empire finds that it's being nibbled away at in the west by the Normans. This is not a desperate situation but it is a nuisance. And then in the east you have the appearance of the Turks. Remember that after about 750 the Arabs go into a long decadence. That great Islamic caliphate breaks up into semi-autonomous and then autonomous and then independent kingdoms and emirates which are as often at war with each other as with any outsider and there is no further trouble to the empire oh the occasional border raid the occasional raid that gets out of hand and needs to be fought off with a regular army but for the most part the arabs are not a problem and the arabs in 1070 haven't been a problem since time out of mind but the Arabs have now been joined by the Turks a people who have existed in and around the area since at least the time of Justinian but they have now around 900 AD mostly converted to Islam they have risen to positions of irreplaceable importance. 
within the increasingly decadent Abbasid Caliphate. And then they take over the Caliphate and they take over large areas of the Islamic lands in the Near East. Under Alp Arslan, one of their greatest leaders, and here is a representation of him, not a portrait, a representation of him on the bottom right of the slide. The Turks move into the empire, not, I think, with the intention of defeating it, not with the intention, I think, of replacing it, but they move into the empire, they make an attack in 1071, the Emperor, Romanus IV, hurries south from Constantinople with his mercenary army and he suffers a total and humiliating defeat. Indeed, it is so total and so humiliating that Romanus himself is taken prisoner. He's taken before Alparslan and this dialogue is said to have taken place. Alparslan, what would you do if I was brought before you as a prisoner, Romanus? Perhaps I'd kill you, or exhibit you in the streets of Constantinople. Alparslan, my punishment is far heavier. I forgive you and set you free. And with those words, Romanus was put on his horse and sent off back to Constantinople. And he has presided over the sudden and radical collapse of the empire as the hegemonic power in the Near East. Look at this map. This is the Near East after 1071. The Turks have taken over what amounts to the whole of the Asian provinces of the empire, what since the time of Justinian have been regarded as the core territories. Indeed, the Turks have established their capital in Nicaea, which is three days march from Constantinople. What is the empire to do to recover that position? The answer is Alexius Comnenus, one of the most able of the emperors, perhaps the most able of the emperors after Basil II, a man of greatness in his own right. Alexius takes the empire over at its lowest point. He's only 24 at the time. The empire is in a state of collapse. Its coinage has been sadly debased. Alexius establishes order. He restores the coinage and he sets about re-establishing the empire as a great power. His problem is that he is hemmed in on both sides by the landed nobility and by the bureaucracy. He is unable to undo the changes that these two groups have presided over during the previous three generations. Those peasant military tenures cannot be revived. There is no possibility of raising a national army to defend the empire and to reconquer the lost territories. It is simply a matter of using the empire's continued commercial prosperity and its continued internal prosperity to buy help from outside. The first diplomatic and military success of Alexius is to recruit the Venetians to the defence of the empire from the Normans. The empire has no navy, but the Republic of Venice, which is a cultural and which has for a long time been a political satellite of the empire, has a very substantial navy, especially in the Adriatic. Alexius strikes a deal with the Venetians. You provide me with unstinting naval support against the Normans, and I will free your merchants from all tolls within my empire. The Venetians look at this and say, how many ships do you want and for how long? We'll build them. It's very successful. The Norman attacks on the Balkans are ended and the empire is secured on that side. For retaking the lost Asian provinces, however, 
it will require more than striking a deal with the Venetians for naval support. Alexius needs a large number of mercenary soldiers. The question is where to get them. If you remember the maps I showed last week, you'll see that there is the growth of an immense Orthodox Commonwealth extending all the way from the Black Sea to the Arctic Circle. Uh, for whatever reason, however, Alexius does not think that recruiting Orthodox Slavic mercenaries will meet his particular need. He wants Western mercenaries. He wants Franks, as they're called. So he writes a letter to the Pope saying, Please, my dear friend Urban, can you arrange for the recruitment of some barbarian mercenaries in the far reaches of the West to come east and help with the protection of my empire? I think the problem for Alexius, and certainly the problem for the empire now and in the future, is that the Greeks have lost track of developments in the West. Just as the eastern Mediterranean has recovered from the demographic collapse of the 6th and 7th centuries, so has the West. The West has also experienced a much more benign climate. And oh, to talk about what's happening in the West would take an entire course. To summarise developments, something astonishing is beginning to happen in the West. A more benign climate is followed by a better growing season and a growing population, but this becomes a self-reinforcing upward spiral which you do not see elsewhere in the world and which, so far as I can tell, never has been seen before. You have a sudden run, the heavy plough, for example, the use of windmills and water mills, chiefly water mills. Soon this will be joined by experiments with steel smelting and clock making and lens grinding. And the wholesale founding or refounding or simple growth of cities. The Greeks, the, the Byzantines, the men in Constantinople, who are facing the Turks, still think of the West as a set of poor territories filled with painted barbarians who are useful mercenaries and not much else. The Empire doesn't know much about the West because Western trade is something handled by the Venetians, and the Venetians have no particular interest in passing on news but the West is no longer filled with painted barbarians running about killing each other. Oh, well, the killing each other, that still carries on. But the populations, they've already exceeded the peak of Roman times, and you have the growth of large and powerful national kingdoms. You have England, of course, but you have France, and you have a large and increasingly wealthy German Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. Here are some figures. The population of Western Europe. Now, this is all very conjectural. We don't know for sure that this is going on, but this is not a bad set of estimates. The population of the British Isles in 1,000, about 2 million. 300 years later, it has risen by 250%. Now, of course, we're still talking about 1090, 1100, but, well, these changes are well underway. And at the bottom right of this slide, you have another estimate of European population growth. And notice the growth between 800 and 1000. And although the changes are not that great, the direction of change is obvious. And Western Europe, by the time Alexius writes his letter of request to the Pope, is already an expanding civilization. Alexius and his advisers in Constantinople 
think of Westerners as rough, barbarous people with helmets and chainmail who are easily managed, easily bribed, and who are good fighters as long as they are firmly handled. They don't think anything of the civilization of the West but the West is very rapidly moving towards the state of affairs which is summarised in the picture on the left-hand side of the slide of a late medieval bank with those very acquisitive Italian bankers looking lovingly over their mountains of gold. Of course, Europe doesn't look like this in 1099 or any time until about 50 or 100 years after, but this is the direction in which Europe is going, and the Byzantine emperor and his advisers are not sure at all of what they're dealing with, or rather they are sure what they're dealing with, but they are badly ill-advised. They're suffering from a serious misapprehension as to the nature of the barbarian mercenaries they're proposing to recruit. But Alexius sends off his request to the Pope, and the Pope is not terribly interested in saving the Empire's Asian provinces. No, indeed. Urban II is currently at a council in France, the Council of Clermont, which is concerned with reforming the Western Church, restoring it to its primitive simplicity. And at the height of the council, at its closing sessions, the Pope makes a speech. He calls on Western Christians to stop fighting each other, but instead to adopt lives of piety and to go to the aid of the Christians who are beset by the Turks. And here is one of the key points of what he has said to have said. We have no transcript of his speech. We have paraphrases from somewhat after the event. Let those who have been accustomed unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with victory this war which should have been begun long ago. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as mercenaries for small pay now obtain the eternal reward. Let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for a double honour. The Pope promises immediate absolution of all sins for those who die on the way to the Holy Land or die in battle against the Turks. The Pope is not saying, who'd like to go and fight as a mercenary for the emperor? He's proposing a crusade, a crusade for the retaking of the Holy Land from Islam. And the Pope's speech is met with thunderous cries of Deus Vult, God wills it. And there is an immediate stirring of activity throughout France, England and Germany not, as I keep on saying, for the recovery of the empire, but for the reconquest of the Holy Land, for rolling back the Islamic conquests of the 7th century. And here is a fine 19th century representation of the Pope's speech in Clermont. You have the Pope sitting with that great black beard. You've got someone reading out the Emperor's letter, and you have everybody listening to this in various transports of religious emotion. You can never trust these 19th century representations to be entirely accurate, but something like this did happen. The Pope's speech at the Council lit a fuse that very quickly exploded, and so a series of vast armies, not an army, but a series of vast armies began to make its way across Europe towards Constantinople. And here are the main events of the First Crusade. The 
Emperor and his advisors hear that an uncountable army of Western barbarians is across the Danube and now deep into imperial territory. They are as the grains of sand on the seashore and they're heading towards Constantinople. Alexius looks over the walls of Constantinople as an army, an estimated army of a 100,000 battle-hardened Westerners turns up. He responds to this by shutting the gates and looking at their campfires from the city walls. However, Alexius gets the leaders of the crusade, the first crusade we shall call it, he gets the leaders of the First Crusade, one at a time, inside the walls of the city, and he gets them to sign a standard, he gets them to swear a standard oath. The oath is that they will do nothing to harm the Empire, and they will also return any territories to the Empire, which have been territories of the Empire within living memory. In exchange for that, Alexius gives them food and money and general moral support and promises further support as and when this may be necessary. He points them across the straits saying the Turks are that way and has them ferried across to the Asian shore and they march off until they are visible only as a cloud of dust on the southern horizon at which point I suppose the Emperor and his advisers breathed a sigh of relief and thought, hmm, that's an unusual one, isn't it? Only, of course, you have an 11th century blitzkrieg. The Crusaders march straight through the lost Asian provinces of the Empire. They retake Nicaea. They annihilate the Turks at the Battle of Dorylion. They take Antioch. They take Edessa. They take Jerusalem. They achieve every possible object of the crusade as they have conceived it. Their conquests are accompanied by looting and slaughter on a scale which in the more settled environment of the Near East is considered almost inconceivable but it is plain that when the Westerners fight under united and effective leadership, they are completely unbeatable, and that there is no limit to the number of Westerners who are able to come out and join in the work of conquest. The immediate response of Alexius to this unexpected explosion of the West into the Near East is to re-establish good diplomatic relations with the Turks and all the other Islamic powers in order to tr try to check the advance of the Crusaders, but it is to no effect. Here, by 1135, you have the Crusader states, as they will remain, give or take a few expansions or losses, until the end of the 13th century. But Alexius does succeed in his immediate goal, which is to recover all of the valuable territories of the former Asian territories of the empire. You can see that by 1180, the empire has substantially recovered. It's just that the recovery is largely on paper. The empire controls a large amount of territory, but the empire is being consumed from within. The empire has found repeatedly that its short-term interest is best served not by undergoing the same process of internal revolution and renewal as it went through during its last emergency. None of the reforms of Heraclius are now repeated, what the empire finds in its short-term interest is to make repeated deals with Venice and the other Italian city-states in which the merchants of those city-states are given commercial privileges at the expense of 
native merchants so that the entire external and internal carrying trade of the empire falls into the hands of the Italian merchants. At the same time, the empire still has no native army or navy. It relies on mercenaries. And the empire is in a position of structural weakness. It is unable to match. Indeed, it is unable to understand the rapid course of improvement that is underway in the West. Increasingly, the emperors feel that the real enemy is not the Turks, it's not any of the Islamic powers, it is the Franks, with their loud voices and their big beards and their unstoppable military machines and their almost unlimited numbers and wealth. But for the first hundred years after Alexius Comnenus becomes emperor, things appear to go not too badly for the empire. It recovers most of its lost territory. It maintains a balance of power in the Near East between the Crusaders and their Islamic enemies. But the empire is rotting away within. Here is a picture, or here is a representation, of Andronicus. He is one of the descendants of Alexius. In 1182, he makes himself emperor. He is a man with a controversial reputation. It seems that he understood perfectly well what was wrong with the empire. The Peasant lands had been increasingly engrossed by the landed nobility. The bureaucracy was absorbing most of the fruits of the taxes paid to the empire. Most of the empire's commerce had now fallen into the hands of Italian merchants who did not have the long-term interests of the empire in mind. The empire was surviving. It was living in the diplomatic sense from hand to mouth. It was relying on the probability that everything would always go right, whereas increasingly things were not going right. When he took power in 1182, Andronicus tries for a with a bound he was free strategy. During the next few years, you have mass executions of the nobility and upper administration and the confiscation of the noble estates. You then have laws against corruption and the sale of offices. You have executions within the imperial family. You also have a massacre of the Italian mercantile communities, which have until now enjoyed effective self-government in large areas of Constantinople. As a strategy, you can denounce the mass bloodshed. You can also regret that Andronicus has broken with what has been for many centuries now the standard prejudice of the Byzantine government against shedding blood. So far, the Byzantine state has tended not to kill its enemies. You deal with enemies by locking them in monasteries or blinding them. Andronicus has no time for this. He wants mass executions, and that is what he gets. It is easy to denounce his policy, but it is a policy which firmly continued for several years, might have prevented the empire from collapsing. But Andronicus makes enemies who are too powerful. In 1185, there's a coup against Andronicus, and he is tortured horribly to death over three days. You can read the accounts of his long and slow execution, but I won't go into the details myself. All of Andronicus's laws are repealed, and the ones that can't be repealed are ignored. From this point, the empire's borders crumble. The collapse is sudden, and every so often the empire tries to draw 
new boundaries, to try to draw new frontiers to defend them. But these frontiers crumble as well until by the beginning of the 13th century, by 1203, the empire effectively amounts to the city of Constantinople, a small hinterland around the city and large areas of mainland Greece. Now, the politics of what happens next are rather complex. There is a fourth crusade gathering in northern Italy and moving down into Corfu. The object of this crusade is to take Egypt. And the reason it wants to take Egypt is because this is the best way to shore up a difficult position for the Crusader kingdoms in the Middle East. However, the Byzantine government owes a large debt to the government of Venice. The Venetians are supposed to transport the Fourth Crusade to Alexandria. The deal that is worked out is that the Venetians will transport the Crusader army not to Egypt in the first instance, but to Constantinople in order to ensure that the empire will continue to service its debts to the Republic of Venice, after which the Crusaders will be allowed to continue on to Alexandria and to shore up the Kingdom of Jerusalem. However, once the Venetians transport the Crusaders to Constantinople, they find that there has been a revolution in Constantinople. The empire has fallen into endemic political instability. The Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, has taken charge. He's taken personal charge of the diverted crusade. Dandolo has a grudge against the empire because many years before it had blinded him. And the Venetians now look at the altered position within the city and arrange for an immediate siege of the city. Their ambition is to take over the empire for themselves and it does look as though they're able to do this. Since Basil II the new interests which dominate the empire have had no interest in an army or a navy. They've also had no particular interest in maintaining the walls, those great walls built by Theodosius. The empire has no navy, and so it can't secure its home waters. Its walls are not in good condition. On the 12th of April, 1204, the Crusaders make a great assault on the city. The land walls, those are still impregnable, but Venetian ships come quite close to the sea walls and they manage to get onto some of the towers. And then some knights manage to squeeze through holes in the sea walls. And of course, once you've got even a few dozen men inside the walls, they can hurry down and push open one of the gates the Crusaders enter the city, there's vicious street fighting, and, oh, something worth mentioning, the Varangian Guard, the Emperor's personal bodyguard, is mostly at the moment staffed with English mercenaries. The English soldiers defending the Emperor put up a frantic defence, but they're massively outnumbered. The Emperor Alexis V, he leaves the city that night. He's later on caught and tortured to death. The Venetians had the idea that they would take Constantinople and they would take over the empire as a going concern. But they lose control of the Crusader army. What was supposed to be a surgical capture of Constantinople turns into ruthless looting of the city, followed by the lighting of fires which spread uncontrollably, burning an entire third of the city down. The fires rage for three days. The crusaders smash their way into the tombs of the emperors and throw the bones of all the emperors since Justinian out into the streets to the dogs so they can get at the gold and precious stones that are within the imperial tombs. 
They break into the churches. They pull down statues from plinth, statues, bronze statues that have been taken there by Constantine and his successors, statues which date back to the 4th and 5th centuries BC, and they melt these statues down to coin, into money, and they burn the warehouses, and the fires spread from the warehouses to the libraries, and it's during this three days of burning that 90% of classical Greek literature goes up irrecoverably in smoke. There is a story of how the refugees get into boats to hurry across the Black Sea towards the safe places in the orthodox kingdoms to the north, and they look back and see this great pall of black smoke over the city, and much of that black smoke is comprised of the parchment books in the libraries. And that appears to be the end. Enrico Dandolo has got his revenge on the empire for what it did to him 20 years earlier. Although he is no longer buried in the Hagia Sophia, if you go there you can still see his grave marker. It's in the galleries. You walk up ramps going upwards. You walk up those ramps and there is a monument to Henricus Dandolo. The fires burn and burn. The looting and the murdering runs further and further out of control. And, but the Venetians still do their best. They go around the city getting everything that they possibly can, securing possession of it, taking it under their own diplomatic protection and you can still see a lot of the booty or a lot of the salvaged booty from Constantinople in Venice. You have those four horses of Corinthian bronze. You have oh, many beautiful and precious things. After this the empire is simply divided up. The Venetians get what they want, the Crusaders get what's given to them, and a new empire starts. The Pope at the moment is Innocent III, and this was his crusade. He wanted the Crusaders to go and take Egypt. It is supposed to be one of the great coups that will secure the Kingdom of Jerusalem as far ahead as anyone can see. Instead, the Venetians have got hold of it and used it to take and sack Constantinople. Innocent III was very angry. He wrote a series of letters. He writes to Baldwin, Count of Flanders and Hainaut, the leader of the crusade. You took upon yourselves the duty of delivering the Holy Land from the infidel, you were forbidden under pain of excommunication from attacking any Christian lands, unless they refused you passage or would not help you. And even then, you were to do nothing contrary to the wishes of my legate. You had no claims or pretensions to the lands of Greece. You were under the most solemn vows of our Lord, and yet you have totally disregarded these vows. It was not against the infidel, but against Christians that you drew your sword. It was not Jerusalem that you captured, but Constantinople. It was not heavenly riches upon which your minds were set, but earthly ones. But far and above all of this, nothing has been sacred to you, neither age nor sex. In the eyes of the whole world, you have abandoned yourselves to debauchery, adultery and prostitution. You have not only violated married women and widows, but even women and virgins whose lives were dedicated to Christ. You have looted not only the treasures of the emperor and of citizens, both rich and poor, but have despoiled the very sanctuaries of God's church. You have broken into holy places, stolen the sacred objects of altars, even including crucifixes, and you have pillaged innumerable images and relics of the saints. It is hardly surprising that the Greek church, beaten down though it is, rejects any obedience to the apostolic see. It is hardly surprising that it sees in all Latins no more than treachery and the works of the devil, and regards all of them as curs. And I'm afraid that is still very much the situation. And to the Doge of Venice, 
It was you who deliberately deflected a crusading army designed to make war upon the Saracens. You despised my legate and treated my excommunication of you with contempt. You have broken your Christian vows and have despoiled the churches and the treasures. Tell me, if you can, how you can ever redeem yourself. You have turned aside a Christian army destined for the Holy Land. With this great and powerful army, not only Jerusalem, but even part of Babylon, i.e. Cairo, might have been captured. The proof of this is that an army which could so easily take Greece and Constantinople could equally well have captured Alexandria and the Holy Land from the infidels. And with those words, Innocent excommunicated everyone in sight and declared public mourning in Rome. But the job was done. There is the division of the empire after 1204. The outlying areas of the empire, those are taken over by Orthodox peoples, Orthodox Slavs. The Greeks, they do take the empire of Nicaea, that red area. They hold on to it. The Latins are not able to take that and they just leave it to the Greeks. But the city of Constantinople and its surroundings and eastern Greece, those are taken by the Crusaders and they're given to a new Latin emperor who rules the city for the next half century. And these purple areas are parceled out among the emperor's various followers according to western notions of feudal landholding. The green areas, those rather nice areas, Rhodes, Crete, Euboea, or what is now called Negroponte, Kefalonia and Corfu, those are taken by the Republic of Venice because Venice regards those as eminently worth having it's not particularly interested in control of the rest because it can dominate those through its trading operations. And it looks as though the empire is at an end. Its collapse has been rapid. It is something which has taken place over the course of not more than 20 years. But the empire's decay has been rapid and apparently irreversible. It looks as if the empire has now ceased to exist. Something that has happened over the course of 175 years since the death of Basil II. It seemed a very good strategy at first to get rid of the armed forces and to allow the nobility and the bureaucratic classes to take over direction of the empire and nearly 200 years is a long time for the final consequences to be felt but in 1204 the final consequences of those choices were felt and they appear to have brought the empire to a sudden and irretrievable ruin only of course it's not the end now i do apologize for the intermission but for the moment, I'll let you go and hope that next week we shall have a smoother experience in the session.